Welcome back to another session of Digging Deeper. May we start with the word of prayer. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be always acceptable to you. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. In this session, 12th session, um, on the subject, the great and glorious day of the Lord, we're going to look at a character who has appeared multiple times. And I want to look at more in details at him. Now the way I've looked at this, this subject, the, the events coming up to the second coming of Jesus, is making runs at it from different angles, from different perspectives, looking at different um, different elements, starting right from the front and ending up at the second coming and things such as that. This particular character appears throughout and by the end of this you will see why. We've met him, he's come by the name of the little horn, the prince to come, the king, the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, the beast, or possibly the name that most people would know him by, even non-Christians, is the Antichrist. And what I hope to look at is who is this person and what is he doing during this time? What is his purpose? And we hopefully we'll see as we go along. I want to start right at the beginning though because his coming was foretold right at the beginning of the Bible. Let's go to the book of Genesis and we're looking at chapter 3 of Genesis. These are the events after the, the fall of man, after um, Adam and Eve have eaten the fruit. And this is God now passing sentence and he starts off by passing sentence on one of the main the main villain of the piece really. Verse 14 of chapter 3 of Genesis. And the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel now when you, you you first read this you just think well women obviously get worried about snakes biting their children that's where this comes from there's actually more to it than that firstly normally in the bible the, the seed line is by the man that's how it describes it, is the seed of Abraham, the seed of Jacob, the seed of Isaac, the seed of David, not via a woman. So to say the seed of the woman is unusual in the Bible. And if we look at the first person in the Bible who had no earthly father, that was Jesus Christ. He was the first person who could describe himself as the seed, in earthly terms, as the seed of the woman. So if we have the seed of the woman, we also have the seed of the serpent. Now the serpent, we know from elsewhere, especially the book of Revelation, that snake was the devil, it was Satan. So the seed of the devil, the, the, the child, if you like, of the devil. Now, let's go to the, um, to the book of John. I want to show you how this word is used sometimes in the Bible. Now the, the Jews had a, a way of using the term son of, which meant more than just literally the son of. It could mean that you literally, that was your father. It could also mean that as a son of Abraham, it meant you were part of the Jewish race. They had a, a particular one that I like in the old authorised version, a son of Belial, which means, Belial means worthlessness or vanity. So a son of worthlessness. And you can imagine that's an insult, calling somebody a son of worthlessness. And having worked at KFC for a long time and seen all the yobs who hang around outside the front of the store or the drunks who come in at the night and abuse my staff, quite a few of them would have the title Son of Belial put upon them. They are sons of worthlessness. Let's have a look though how Jesus uses this term. And um, we're going to uh, John and we're chapter 8. And it's 42 uh, to 44. So John chapter 8, 42. To 44 and here the the pharisees are talking with jesus they're arguing about who his father is if you like jesus said to them 
If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceed forth and have come from God. For I have not even come of my own initiative, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I am saying? Is it because you cannot hear my words? You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desire of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So here's Jesus making himself very popular with the religious class by calling them sons of the devil. Um, obviously not physical sons, but in this sense spiritual sons of the devil. So the way they are living, the, what they are choosing, that the choices they are making come from the devil and not from God. So, in Genesis we have this idea of the seed of the devil will clash with the seed of the woman. So it doesn't just mean that those people who effectively disregard God and choose to follow the ways of the devil, does it literally mean that? There is possibly something more. Let's go back to the book, back to the book of Genesis. Genesis 6. There's a passage here which has caused con some controversy over the years. And it's set during the time when, um, this is before the flood, when mankind is working on conscience, if you like. Um, they have no set of rules, there's no um, government, there's no set of rules, there's no Ten Commandments, there's anything like that. They're going literally by their conscience. And man is starting to multiply and spread throughout the earth. And we're starting at verse 1 of chapter 6 and going on to verse 5. And it came about when man became to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives of them, whoever they chose. Matters arising there. The first question is, who are the sons of God? Some people say it was the, um, the faithful line that stayed faithful to God. And indeed, in the, the, the chapter just before that, it talks about the two family trees, effectively the family tree that ended up with Abraham and the family tree that um, petered out, or didn't peter out, but they only go to seven generations and then they don't follow anymore. Some people say that that was the intermingling, so the two family trees as such. But that's not how the Bible describes the sons of God. If you remember the book of Job, at the very beginning of the book of Job, um, it says that the sons of God were coming to present themselves before him, and Satan was amongst them. So if we take the, 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 the standard picture in the Bible, the sons of God refers to the angels. So here you have a more complex relationship. Here you have angels looking down and seeing women and fancying them and taking them and having children with them as we will see which is let us just say complicated let's read from verse 3 and the Lord said my spirit will not strive with man forever because he also is flesh nevertheless his days shall be 120 years uh, it was from when this was said it was 120 years until the flood came so that's where that came from as opposed to a length of life. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men of old, men of renown. And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent and thought of his heart was only evil continuously. That last verse, by the way, if you, if you want to see what God saw when he looked at the heart of man and the mind of man, you look at the internet. Because now we can all look inside the mind of man. And in a very few clicks, you can get to some very, very dark places. Now, verse 4, the Nephilim. Here we go. 
In the old authorised version, I think this was translated as giants. The giants were in the land in those days, which is one translation of it. Um, a better translation, um, I looked up in my, my Bible dictionary. A bully, a tyrant, a giant, a hero, a fierce warrior. All of those, you can see how all of those would fit in. These were, they described them as the mighty men on the earth. So these were the great leaders. These were the, the man who would stand at the front, who you might think is a hero, but everybody else thinks is a tyrant and a bully. If we take this at its face value, it means that the angels came and had sex with women, and the resultant offspring became the Nephilim became these mighty men, became the rulers, if you like, on the earth. So this was the seed of angels and women. Now, God got upset about this. Um, and the flood was ordained because of this event, because of the interbreeding between angels and humanity. Now, why did it happen? Is it just that the, the, the angels, and here I am talking about the fallen angels, those who fell with the, with the fall of Satan, those who gave way to his mindset, the, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Was there a plan to this or did it just happen? Or was this indeed Satan's way of trying to undo the threat that God had made early on to the snake? That the seed of the woman will crush the seed of the serpent. But if the seed of the woman is corrupted, if the seed of the woman is mixed with the seed of the serpent, then that won't happen. So here's right on. This, this could be Satan's way of trying to prevent that promise that God made coming true, to try to corrupt it, to try to twist it. And we will see this again and again in the Bible, how Satan tries to destroy and undo the, the promises of God, the threats of God, if you like. Now, did God take this line down? Obviously, the flood came. The flood wiped out all of mankind apart from eight. Later on, if you know the story in Exodus, when the, the 12 spies are spent into the, the land of uh, Canaan, they come back and said, we saw giants, the Nephilim are there. Um, now this is, well, basically these 10 spies were lying. They didn't see the Nephilim, but they knew their family history. They knew the idea of these, these giants, these heroes, who once, these, these bullies who were once in the land. When they went into the land, they saw people like Goliath. Because the, the, the giants, the, the sons of Anak were there, they saw them. And they said, the, the, here, be, here be monsters, here be the Nephilim. So in fact, that's a lie. The Nephilim did not survive the flood. When God decides to kill somebody, he kills them. They, they do not survive, they cannot survive like that. What happened though to the, the sons of God? What happened to the angels? Let's go to the book of Jude. There's a, a hint in the book of Jude as to what happens here and we're going to um, what's the first chapter there's only one chapter to verse 6 of Jude the, and the angels who did not keep their own domain but abandoned their proper abode he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day some people have suggested that this verse refers to those angels who um, were the fathers of the Nephilim, those who left their abode, their spiritual abode, and, as it were, descended, fell, and violated something that, that God had not wanted to be violated. It is noticeable that Satan is not amongst them, because Satan has not been locked up all this time. If these angels were locked up from that event onwards, Satan was, has not. Satan has not, as yet, violated that particular standard. One of the few probably he hasn't. The suggestion is therefore that one day Satan will 
violate that standard. That he will breed with a woman. That he will produce a living son. And in the same way that Jesus was the Son of God, by the overpowering of the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, Satan will have his own child by a far more earthly method, if you like. But he will have his own son. So what we have here from the beginning is the idea of the Son of God versus the Son of Satan. And as we look at the events of the last seven years of um, before the coming of Jesus, we see that playing out. The Son of God versus the Son of Satan. Let's start looking at this. Let's go to the book of Daniel. And um, we're going to look at Daniel chapter 9. I'm going to look at some of the other titles that I, I gave there to the Antichrist. And the first one is the prince. I'll look, there's, there's two princes involved in this particular verse. The verse we've looked at before, we're Daniel chapter 9, and we're verses uh, 25 and 26. This is in the prophecy about the, the 70 weeks. So we're looking at... Uh, Chapter 9 of Daniel, verse 25 and 26. So you are to know and to discern that from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, notice there the Messiah was called the Prince, there will be 70 weeks and uh, seven weeks and 62 weeks. And it will be built again, this is Jerusalem, with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. And after the 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. This is Jesus, this is the Messiah. And the people of the prince who is to come, here we have another prince, a prince who is to come in the future. One prince has been cut off and has nothing, one prince is yet to come in the future. The prince who is to come, the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary and its end will come with a flood even to the end, there will be war, desolation and destruction are determined. Now, at that time, the people who destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD were the Romans. So we have a, when it says the people of the prince to come, now that suggests that the, the people were Romans, therefore the prince to come, whoever this prince will be, will be of Italian, Roman origin. Keep that in mind. We'll look at that later on again. So here we have the just um, of two princes, the prince, the Messiah, and the prince who is to come. Keep that in your mind. Let's go back in Daniel a little bit to chapter seven. Once again, a passage we've done. If you can remember the, the beast that came from the sea. The the beast that rose up. If you remember there's, there's Daniel's vision of four beasts. And the last one had ten horns. It's a, a, a wicked wee beastie with um, ten horns which were ten leaders. And a small horn rose up and uprooted three of the others and took over the, if you like, took over the running of the, the, the beast. So get the idea of the of a horn, the little horn, as being a leader who rises up and takes over. So we're looking at Daniel, and it's chapter 7, and it's verse 8. And while I was contemplating the horn, behold, another horn, a little one, came up amongst the amongst them and three of the first horns were pulled out from their roots before it and behold this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and it was uttering great boasts this is the equivalent of the prince who is to come so now we have him described as a horn that a leader there's a, a, a ram or a, a goat whatever they were fighting they would fight with their horns it would be the leader who was leading them so here we have the, this character described as starting off as a small, small character, a small irrelevant character, if you like. It's the, the antlers with the biggest stags that win the battles. 
It's not the ones with the small, stat, the small horns. This beast had 10 horns to start with. That's 10 leaders. So if you remember the section we talked about, the, the world power that rises, the world as if it will be divided up into 10 regions, each region with its own leader. And this will be a military organisation. And they will be, as it were, equal to each other, but vying with each other probably at the same time. And a smaller character will arise. One who is not one of the great leaders. Now, if you can think of um, something like the United Nations, you have all the different leaders there. But it isn't necessarily those who are the spokesmen for that organisation. Um, they will choose somebody to put forward as a spokesman or a negotiator. And that person who hasn't got the power of the others, but that person becomes the, as it were, the mouthpiece of the organisation. And that is what I wonder if is happening here. A character who is a minor player, if you like, in this world power, is put forward as a spokesman, as a negotiator. And rises through the ranks. And when people are not expecting it, he takes control. Let's look on. Let's go to chapter 8 of Daniel. And we'll see the same type of thing again here. Uh, chapter 8, verses 9 to 12. And in this particular section, it's God's been describing how the, the Greek Empire will take over the, the Medo-Persian Empire. And it describes it as a, as a battle between a ram and a goat. So that the ram being the, the Medo-Persian Empire and this shaggy goat that comes flying across the, um, the land and slams into this ram and takes it over. Um, the ram having one, um, one large horn, which in the terms of the Greek Empire was Alexander the Great, who literally wiped away the Persian Empire. He just flew across. In fact, he, he took out everybody he fought against. And in that vision in Daniel, it talks about the, the, the one major horn on this goat being broken off. What happened is Alexander the Great was sweeping all before him right into India. So the, the, the Macedonian Greek Empire went right into India. He wanted to continue fighting to take over the entire world. His generals didn't want to and they persuaded him out of it. So they all retreated back to Babylon. And he set himself up as king of the whole empire in Babylon. And there, very mysteriously, he died. He was a young, fit man. And he fell ill and he died. And much speculation, of course, was it natural, was it poison, etc. Whatever happened after that, the um, his generals, as it were, divvied up the kingdom um, between themselves. So rather than one of them taking over... They divided it up. So, for instance, that one of the generals, Ptolemy, took over Egypt. Uh, others went back to Macedonia or to um, the Syria, Babylonian Empire. And there were basically four major divisions um, that were set up during this time. And this is um, this is talking about the events following that. So we're in Daniel chapter 8 and we're looking at verse 9. Verse uh, 9 to 12. And out of one of them, this is out of one of the, the horns that was uh, one of the, the, the generals, one of the generals who split up into the, um, the different nations. Out of one of these generals, out of one of them came forth a rather small horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, and towards the beautiful land, the beautiful land being Israel. And it grew up to the host of heaven and caused some of the host and some of the stars to fall to the earth and it trampled them down. And it even magnified itself equal to the commander of the host and it removed the regular sacrifice from him and the place of the sanctuary was thrown down. And on account of transgression the host will be given over to the horn along with the regular sacrifice and it will be and he will fling truth to the ground 
and perform his will and will prosper. This little horn here, in this case referring to the Greek Empire, is the same as the little horn on the beast. It's the small one that grows up and takes over. Now if you take this particular passage, this suggests that the this person, this prince, this horn, is actually of Greek descent, not of Italian. We shall look at that again later on. Let's go on to um, chapter 10 of Daniel, because this needs a bit of unpacking. One of the things that that passage said is that this little horn would grow up to the heavens and would throw down the stars. Now, where we have looked at the book of Revelation so far, stars have always represented angels. So here we have a human who can throw down angels and trample them on the ground. The host it referred to in that particular passage, if you look at that, that's referring to the Jewish host, because later on it, it basically outlines that. That's the, the Jewish people, the Jewish nation is also overcome. But here is a person who can throw down angels. Now that's more than any human being can do. So let's go to the book of um, Daniel again. And I want to look at chapter 10, verse 2 to 21. Quite a long passage. In those days, I, Daniel, had been mourning for three entire weeks. I did not eat any tasty food, nor any meat or wine entered my mouth. I did not use ointments at all until the entire three weeks were completed. And on the 24th day of the first month, while I was in the banks of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked. And behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen, whose waist was girded with a belt of pure gold of Ophaz. His body was like a barrel, his face had the appearance of lightning, his eyes were like a flaming torch, his arms and feet were gleaming like polished bronze, and the sound of his words was like the sound of a tumult. Now I, Daniel, alone saw this vision, while the men who were with me did not see the vision. Nevertheless, a great dread fell upon them, and they ran away to hide themselves. So I left, I was left alone and saw the great vision, yet had no strength was left in me, and my natural colour was turned to a deathly pallor, and I retained no strength. But I heard the sound of his words, and as soon as I heard the sound of his words, I fell into a deep sleep, sleep on, the, on my face, with my face to the ground. Now that description sounds remarkably similar to the description of Jesus at the beginning of the book of Revelations. As we go on and read more of it, you will find out that this person isn't an angel. He doesn't say, I was, um, I was sent by God, I was sent by anybody else. He says, I came to you. And he speaks with authority, not as a messenger, but as, as if he has the authority himself. In Jewish terms, um, this is what they were called the angel of Jehovah, or the angel of God. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, it's where God appears in a human form. And it happens quite a few times in the Old Testament. So here we have God in person, in human form, and we would say that would be Jesus, coming to see Daniel. Let's continue reading from verse 10. Then behold, a hand touched me, and he set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man of high esteem, understand the word I am about to tell you, and stand upright. I have now been sent to you, and when he had spoken his words to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said, Do not be afraid, Daniel, for from the first day 
that you set your heart to understand this and on humbling yourself before God your word was heard and I have come in response to your word but the prince of the kingdom of Persia was withstanding me for 21 days then behold Michael one of your chief princes came to help me for I had been left for I had been left with the king of Persia now I have come to give you an understanding of what will happen to your people in the latter days for the vision pertains to the days yet future if this is God if this is Jesus who on earth can stop him for 21 days if he sets out to seek Daniel but he cannot reach him for 21 days I get a little annoyed in Sunday school where sometimes we sing songs about how great God is and how great God can do anything and nothing is too much for him and to be honest that goes on into some of the churches as well and some of the songs we sing we sing how wonderful how God is and how he nothing can stop him he can do whatever he likes whenever he likes however he likes and yet here in the Bible it says that that God that Jesus could not get to Daniel for 21 days he was being prevented now it says by the the Prince of Persia I think it was the Prince of Persia is that a physical king is that one of I say Darius or Cyrus preventing Jesus coming to Daniel of course not in this case it's a spiritual king or spiritual prince it is a demon demonic force over each of the kingdoms of this world I think Satan has set up a, a demon in charge and that demon had the power to prevent Jesus getting to Daniel for 21 days hmm and I'm not making this up you've just read it it's in the Bible it's there Now we say, well, why doesn't God just, God's God, God, God could just press the nuclear button, if you like. He could just wipe these, these enemies away, wipe them out of his way. Why doesn't he do that? And the reason we've looked into in a previous session is that God gives people a chance. He gives them an option. He's given people a decision to make. And he will not take that away from people so he will not use the power of the creator he will not use his ultimate authority if you like he is using conventional warfare not nuclear warfare in the battle for the earth and so god is as it were restraining the power that he will use to defeat his enemies which satan probably sees as a very good thing and so here it is possible for the demons to prevent God's message getting to where it's supposed to go to even to a man of God like Daniel and we see that the person of Michael Michael the archangel uh, in scripture Michael and in the uh, book of revelations he is seen to be the angel who God has put in charge of the Jewish people he and his as angels under him as it were it's, it's a warfare going on so on earth there was a spirit as a physical warfare in the heavenly places there is a spiritual warfare going on and Ang Michael and his angels had to come in and as it were fight with Jesus around him to get him through to Daniel that's a very different to the way most of us think of what the heavenly places are like let's go to the book of Ephesians let's go to the book of Ephesians very famous passage chapter 6 and it's verse 10 finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against powers, against world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness 
in heavenly places. You need to start seeing a another dimension to understand the book, uh, the, this, the events of the second coming. There are two battles going on here. There's one on earth, and there's one in heaven. And the one is heaven is not as straightforward as we see it to be. There's a battle between the prince, the Messiah, and the prince who is to come. That little horn who is able to throw down angels and trample them. Who has the power to fight in the spiritual realm. Let's go on to the book of Revelations. And one of the strange things about this character, this prince, this, this, this horn, is that he has the permission from God to do what he's doing. And we find that out in chapter 6 of Revelations. And it's verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, this is the first of the seven seals on the, the seven sealed scroll that the Lamb was given right at the beginning, the, the scroll that has the judgment of the earth in it. And he broke one of the seven seals. I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice of thunder, Come! And I looked and beheld a white horse, and he who sat on it had a great bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. Those of you who know the book of Revelations, you know that when Jesus is pictured as coming at the end of the time, he comes on a white horse. Riding from heaven with the, the angels and the hosts of heaven behind him. And yet here's another character who's riding on a white horse and going out to conquer. This character is the same as the prince who is to come, is the same as the little horn. This is the person who God is, as it were, saying, right, off you go. Go on, have a go. If you think you can do it, go. In the same way that God said to Satan, and in the case of Job, when Satan was complaining how God was protecting Job all the time. God went, okay, go on, try it, see what you can do. You're free to act. And so here, at the beginning, one of the first things that God does in the judgment of the world, he lets the son of Satan loose. Up to this point, he's been restraining his rise to power. But now he says, right, no, nope. okay, off you go. And you notice that this person is riding a white horse. The same as when Jesus, so the prince of the people to come, is riding a white horse. In the same way that the prince, the Messiah, will be riding a white horse. You can see the symmetry going on here. Let's go to the book of Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. Thessalonians is an important book if you want to um, understand these events. And we've been to it many times before. 1 Thessalonians. And it's chapter 5, verses 1 to 3. Now, as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just as a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them, suddenly, like birth pans upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. So in the period before God releases the, the Antichrist, there is peace on the earth. Now this is not peace as we would necessarily want it. This is peace under force. This is when this world power has risen. It has put down wars. It is put down um, religious struggles. It is put down by violence. It has peace in the same way the Roman Empire had Pax Romana 
the peace of Rome. It was by the edge of the sword. Basically, if you put a foot out of line, then they would come and deal with you. So this is the peace that is being spoken of here. But this peace lets them down. They're all saying peace, but suddenly it becomes like, like the birth pangs, like suddenly the contractions start. And it all happens when this man on the white horse is released to conquer. And suddenly this world peace that everybody thinks they have goes wrong. Let's go on to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians 2. And we're looking at verse 3 and 4. Now the name I, I chose to give to this particular study was the Son of Destruction. Um, that's one of the names we're about to see here. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and it's verse 3. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he will take his seat in the temple of God and display himself as being God. Do you not remember, while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? It's interesting to note here that Paul has a knowledge of the events of the second coming in advance and he doesn't have to wait till um, the book of Revelations which was well after um, Paul himself was was killed was martyred so that there was knowledge of the events that were coming already and it was being taught to the churches at this time I digress the man of lawlessness that's the first um, title that's given to me another title here a man of lawlessness now, what do we mean by lawlessness now to the Jews they may have thought of the Mosaic law but this is not a man who is just against the Jewish people he's in charge of the whole world so what does God mean by lawlessness for that let's go to the book of 1 John And we'll see how, how John describes it there. This is John who was at the Last Supper when Jesus gave the command to his disciples, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you. By this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And in the book of 1 John he expands on that. Um, so look at 1 John. Um, chapter 2, uh, 15 to 17. Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. Now where it says do not love there, that, that word love, that is the word agape. Now those of you who have heard the word agape before, you know that that is the, the love of God, the self-sacrificing love of God. But here... John is saying to the to the disciples, do not agape the world. This is the highest form of love. In other words, do not give the highest form of love to this world. This do not sacrifice yourself for this world. Uh, nor the things of the world. If anybody loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is of the world. And this world is passing away, and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. What is the law of God? God is love. The law of God is based on love, not a love of lust, a love of pride, a love of, of uh, the boastful pride of life. It's that self-sacrificing love given to God and given to other people. That is the law of God. 
What did Jesus say when they asked him, what is the greatest commandment? They said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, all your mind and all your strength and your neighbour as yourself. That is the law of God. This is a man of lawlessness. His life is built on the, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the boastful pride of life. He is the polar opposite of the law of love as laid down by Jesus the Messiah. Imagine a person like that, utterly self-centred, utterly devoid of pity, devoid of compassion. Imagine a person like that as your leader. One of the other, the other title, um, the son of destruction. Now, because of the obviously the, the idea of the son being the son of Satan, the son of destruction. Some versions have, I think, the son of perdition, which is another version here. The, the, the word I looked it up in a Bible dictionary for for destruction. Um, it's the word apolia. If you know the book, The Pilgrim's Progress, you will know that the the pilgrim Christian, the pilgrim, has to fight Apollyon. The demon Apollyon in the valley of uh, the valley of darkness, the valley of death. That's where that name comes from. And what that destruction means is the losing or loss, or the ruin. In the New Testament, it refers to a state after death, wherein exclusion from salvation is a realised fact, wherein man, instead of becoming what he might have been, is lost. Or ruined. That's the way the person who wrote that dictionary described it. That after death, a person realizes that they are lost. They realize that they are destroyed. Woe to me, I am undone. But this person, this son of destruction, is like that in his life. He has made a decision that is beyond. It cannot be repaired. It is irreparable. Now, even the Antichrist had a choice. Even he could choose to follow God. But he chooses to follow his father, his father Satan. And he absolutely sells out for that. Now, in that passage, one of the passages we read, we talked about the, the son of destruction taking his seat in the temple and setting himself up as God above all kings and above all gods. And the question is why? Why in the temple in Jerusalem? What is the point of doing that? Let's go to Isaiah. And it's chapter 2. The book of Isaiah is a very important book in the Bible. It's a very important book in understanding what is going on in the mind of God leading up to the, um, the events of the second coming, the events of judgment. And it's a book that Satan is desperate to undermine. He's un desperate to undermine the whole of the Bible, but especially the book of um, Elijah, uh, book of Isaiah. Um, We'll look at that later on. Let's just read this though, because this explains why the Antichrist would want to set up his throne in the temple in Jerusalem. So chapter 2, and it's the first verse for four verses. The word which Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Jews, Judah and Jerusalem. Now it will come about that in the last days, notice that the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and all nations will stream to it. And many people will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And I will judge between the nations, and I will render decisions for many people, and they will hammer their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up na uh, their sword against nation, 
and never again will they learn war. It is from Jerusalem and from the temple that God intends to reign the earth. That is where Jesus will reign from, from Jerusalem and from the temple. And so naturally the, the prince who is to come, the seed of the serpent, the, the man on the white horse, the son of destruction, the son of perdition, will want to reign from there. Because the, his job, his desire, is to take the throne of Jesus on this earth. So naturally, that's where he intends to reign from. And to set up his kingdom there. And more than that, to set up his godhood there. In the same way that Jesus is the Son of God and it is divine, to this man's mind, he is the Son of Satan. He is divine. So his intention is not to replace Jesus, but to supplant him. Everything that Jesus can do, I can do. Think of the magicians, uh, uh, Pharaoh's magicians at the time of Moses. Everything that Moses did, the magicians copied until they got to the gnats and they couldn't copy the gnats. So it's small as a gnat they couldn't manage to do. But this is more impressive though, because this man actually does what God can do, so can I. Let's go on to the next section. Now, for this next section, I want to remind you of one of the rules we looked at right way back in the first, um, the first session we ever did. Um, it's the rule of double reference. Um, we're going to need that to understand the, the passages we're looking at the moment, next. And it says this, a passage may be referring to two different related events that are separated by an undisclosed period of time. Which basically means that one passage, the, the first part of that passage may refer to something that's happened either in the past or happening when it was being written. And the second half of that passage is referring to something that's going to happen in the future. And you don't know how far in the future. If you want examples of that, you have to listen to the first session again, I'm afraid. But Jesus himself uses that technique and very clearly, very distinctly, reading from the book of Isaiah. Interestingly enough, he uses that, that same rule. The other thing I want to, to let you know about is a bit of history. When the um, Alexander the Great died and the, his four generals took over, um, they divided the empire up between them and almost immediately they started to fight amongst themselves and one in particular was trying to take over control of everybody again to reunify the, the empire. And it's in, the so historians call it the Wars of the Diadochi. Um, Diadochi being the Greek for the successors. And it's a, a very interesting time. I didn't know much about it. I actually looked it up on YouTube. I found a very good YouTube channel called Kings and Generals. It's, um, I, I suspect it's made up by people who like to do wargaming and like battle strategy and um, history of that sort. And, but it gave a visual representation of these battles. In fact, they do a whole series on that, and they did a series on the Roman um, invasions that followed the battle between Greek and the Greeks and the Romans, uh, Hannibal, and so forth like that. In fact, the 400 years between the the last book in the the Old Testament and the the New Testament is full of wars and battles, and it's interesting that the time that Jesus and the apostles lived was actually a time of peace. And it was almost selected on purpose by God. I think it was selected on purpose so that the gospel could spread during that time. During the time of the Pax Romana, when the Roman had put down their enemies. And for that short time, anybody could travel anywhere. God uses even his enemies um, to fulfill his purposes. But anyway, the, the wars of the Diadochi, these, these battles, if you look it up and see that there were different 
groups were fighting each other. So the one king who was based in Babylon and Syria was fighting those in um, back in Greece or in uh, Macedonia or in Egypt. And they were fighting backwards and forwards all the time. And there's lots of um, uh, attempted intermarriages between them in order to sort of bring peace and groups. And there's betrayals. And one group was in charge one time, one another. And they're all fighting backwards and forwards. That's the background that God has just been describing. But then he slightly changes tack. And where we have the wall of double reference coming in. Um, so let's go to the book of Daniel. And we're looking at Daniel chapter 11. God has just been describing to Daniel these wars. The wars of the Didoche. The, the wars of the Greek nations fighting against each other. And then he changes tack slightly. So let's go to 11. And we're looking at 35 to 39. Daniel 11, 35 to 39. And here, this first verse is talking about the, the Jewish nation. Some of the people of the Jewish nation who died during this time. And some of those who have insight will fall in order to refine, purge and make them pure until the end time. Because it is still to come at the appointed time. There's the little important phrase. And what happens afterwards is not to do with the war of the Didoche, it's to do with the war in the future. Then the king, which king? This is the little horn. This is the prince of the, pe or the people of the prince to come. This is the, the son of destruction. This is the, um, this is the Antichrist. Then the king will do as he pleases. And he will exalt and magnify himself above every god. He speaks, sits in the temple. He sits in the member of what it says in the book of Thessalonians. This is what Paul was referring back to when he was writing that. And he will speak monstrous things against the God of gods. And he will prosper until the indignation is for f finished. For that which is decreed will be done. And he will show no regard to the gods of his fathers or the desire of women, nor will he show any regard to any other god, for he will magnify himself above them all. But instead he will honour a god of fortresses, a god whose father his fathers did not know. He will honour him with gold and silver and costly treasures. And he will take action against the strongest fortresses. With the help of a foreign god, he will give great honour to those who acknowledge him. And he will cause them to rule over many, and he will parcel out land for a price. This shows what will be happening when the, the son of destruction takes over. And it says here by a foreign god that his fathers did not know. Now once again we, we have it here, this person put in line of the Greek empires, not the Italian empire. And I think, well how can this be? If, if Daniel early on was told that the prince who was to come would be the, the, of the people who destroyed the temple, which we know to be the Roman Empire, surely he has to be Italian. Not quite as simple as that, because the the legions who destroyed the temple, one of them came from Macedonia, modern day Balkans, one of them came from Turkey, and two of them came from Syria. So the people who came were in fact not Italians. The, the people who were in charge probably were. Um, obviously uh, a future emperor I think uh, Vespa uh, uh, Titus was certainly there in Vespasian, I think. But the actual people who were doing the fight in the legions, they were not Roman. They were formed in these other countries. And if you wanted to become a Roman citizen in those days, you either had to pay a very large bribe, or you had to serve in the, the army for 25 years. So people would actually serve in the army in order to become Roman citizens. And that's one of the important ways. But they would... They never actually based the 
the legions in the, the countries that they were formed in either. So if they were formed in Macedonia, they would send them somewhere else to fight. The reason being, um, you don't want to train up people of the country that you are occupying to learn, teach them how to fight because they might suddenly become the, the opposition and to attack you. Such as happened, for instance, um, when the West trained up the Taliban to fight the Russian invaders. And later on, of course, we ended up having to fight the Taliban and lost. So we trained up our own opposition. The Romans weren't so, so foolish. They would take people from one country and then they would move them to another country to fight in that other country. So the, the, the four legions that surrounded Jerusalem and destroyed them, as I say, come from Macedonia, Turkey and Syria. So we cannot from that necessarily say that the whoever this person is, this son of destruction, is Italian or is necessarily Greek either. He is certainly of this empire. He is, a, as it were, a son of this this beast that rises from the sea, which is of multiple nations. And he is one of those. My interpretation looking at this is he's more likely to be of Greek or Macedonian origin than Italian. But we don't know. We do not know. Let's go to Revelations again. Let's go to chapter 13 of Revelations. And I want to look at this, this beast from the sea. We've looked at it several times. But how does this relate to this son of destruction? So verse 30, uh, chapter 13 of Revelation, verse 1. And he, st and he stood on the sand of the seashore. Who is he? In this case, it's Satan. Short time before, the archangel Michael had a war with the Satan and his angels in the heavenly realms and threw them out. When is that going to happen? Not entirely certain. But it's not going to be good news for the earth. That war that has been going on in heaven, the war that stopped even Jesus reaching his destination, uh, or slowed him down from reaching his destination, will come to such a head that Michael and his armies will throw Satan and his armies to the earth and they will be confined to the earth and it's at that stage that Satan um, calls this this world empire up to do his bidding it already exists it already there but now he takes it and he takes it on a new path and Satan stood on the seashore and I saw a beast coming out of the sea having ten horns and seven heads and on the horns were ten diadems, and on the heads were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth was like that of a lion, and the dragon, and the dragon gave him power, and his throne, and great authority. That's the important verse there. And the dragon gave him power and his throne and great authority. Would Satan give that to an organisation? Or would he give it to a person? Would he give it, say, to his son? That little horn that overthrows the others is the son of Satan who puts himself in charge of this beast. If you think of the Nazi party in World War II, you think of the German or the, Ger the German nation, you tend to think of its head, you tend to think of Adolf Hitler. He is, as it were, the head of the Nazi party. He is the head of Germany. He is the one who takes command. And so what we have here is the this organisation, which initially is described as the beast, eventually becomes synonymous with one person. That is the little horn that rises and becomes the head of this organisation. He 
becomes the beast. And so when you read about this beast, you have to be careful to, to, to check, is it talking about the organisation? Or is it talking about the individual who is in charge of the organisation? They can be synonymous. Let's read on a little bit more. Because we're going to come back to this in a while. Verse 3. And I saw one of the heads as if it had been slain. And his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon because he gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who is able to wage war with him? As if slain. What does that mean? Now, if you think back to the session we did on the throne room in heaven, we had the lamb as if it had been slain. And I talked about it there. It's, it's not that Jesus didn't actually die. He did die. But it's the viewer, the, the person saying, well, this lamb was killed, but he's alive. And it's a way of saying someone who has died, but come back to life. So here we have, in verse 3, this seven-headed beast. One of these heads was killed, but has come back to life. What on earth does that mean? Firstly, what do these seven heads mean? Um, let's go to Revelation 17. Let's go to Revelation 17. Um, because the, the heads, what they are, is sort of given a, a description there. So Revelation 17, it's verse 8 to verse 10. And here's another description of the beast, same beast. And the beast you saw was and is not and is about to come out of the abyss and to go into destruction. Son of destruction. And those who dwell on the earth will wonder whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and will come. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. They are the seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, and one is yet to come. And when he comes, he must remain a little while. Needs a little unpacking. Go back to the book of Daniel and think of the vision of the four beasts coming out of the sea. First one like a lion with wings of eagles, then the bear, then the, the leopard with four heads, and then finally this, this um, beastie with twelve or uh, ten horns. Think of it as Satan was prototyping. He was making prototypes of the, emperor, of the, the type of world power that one day he will put his son in charge of. The type of empire that is capable of taking over the world. So when he, he tries the, the Babylonian Empire, it, it's not going to work. So he sweeps that out of the way. He gets the Medo-Persians Empire. He tries something different. He takes part of the Babylonian Empire. The science that we work today is based a lot of it on Babylonian science. And the same with the Medo-Persian Empire. He brings that in and they've got the organisation, which is the main thing there. The way they organise the things, 120 different provinces. Um, that's brought over into the next session when the Greek Empire comes charging in. And there's this all-powerful ruler who just wipes everything out before him. And the Greek culture is there. And that Greek culture is absorbed by the next beast along the line, which is the Roman Empire. They were obsessed with the Greek culture. And indeed, we still are nowadays. If you have a, a country that rises to empire status, its buildings are normally of a Greek design or to Roman design. Roman design was based on the Greek design and the Greek design. And so the Roman then comes into modern day empires. So some of the greatest buildings in this country were based on uh, Greek designs. The, the um, Capitol Hill in America, their, um, their main building there is based on Greek design. And you will see it again and again throughout history. 
when Satan had settled on the, the, the prototype of this, this final empire, the Roman Empire, he then starts prototyping. He, he goes for a different model. So this is the model I'm going to use, but now let's try Mark 1, Mark 2, Mark 3, Mark 4. And it's the type of leadership he wants. And he first started off with kings. That didn't work in the Roman Empire. He then moved them out to... Um, I think consuls and then they had the plebiscites that the rule of the by the people and there was basically there was five different forms of leadership in the Roman Empire some of them mixed together at different times um, so at the time that John was writing those five had already been and gone or were sidelined a bit the sixth type of leadership was in place it was an emperor it was a man who thought he was a god. Those are the, the, the first six heads. The seventh head is the seventh and final mark of this particular prototype. What is it? It's not a man who thinks he's a god. It's a man who, to all practical purposes, is a god. Someone who has the power of Satan. And doesn't say he is God and has nothing to back it up. This guy has it to back it up. So when it talks about the head that has been slain. And in this passage it talks about the one who was. But then wasn't. And then is again. What's it talking about? The suggestion has been made. And you'll see in another section. It talks. It very specifically talks about the beast whose head had been slain. Again that the, at some stage in his rise to power the Antichrist will actually be killed not by God but by probably those he is fighting against those who see him as a danger and try to remove him from this world and he is very publicly and very obviously removed from this world he dies and yet somehow he is raised again not by the power of God, but by the power of Satan. Here we have a, a hybrid person, a person who is half demon and half human, a person whose spiritual being can be brought back again. So if we compare him with Jesus, Jesus who came, who died, who rose again. Here we have the Antichrist who came, who died, who rose again. Once again, we have a symmetry. This is the suggestion here. There, there may be other explanations for it, but I, I favour this particular explanation. And it would make sense. Because everybody then says, who can fight against this person? That They've killed him already and he's come back alive. And you notice in this particular case, when Jesus came back to life, he hid himself. He didn't show himself to the populace. He showed himself in secret to his disciples so that faith could be allowed to make the decision. This is not what the Antichrist does. He shows himself to the world and he makes sure that everybody in the world knows what has happened, knows what he can do and knows that you can't kill me. Whatever you do, however you try, you can poison me, you can shoot me, you can do whatever you like, you can't kill me. And that's causes fear and that causes a lot of the leaders of the world to say you know what you're the boss let's go back to Revelation 13 again and we're going back to verse 5 so we're carrying on from where we read a little while earlier on Revelation 13 and it's verse 5 to verse 10 And there was given to him a mouth, speaking arrogant words and blasphemies, and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And he opened his mouth to blaspheme against God and to blaspheme his name and his tabernacles, that he may, uh, that is, those who dwell in heaven. And it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. 
and all who dwell on the earth will worship him, every one whose name has not been written in the book um, from the foundations of the world in the Lamb's book of life who has been slain. If anybody has ears, let him hear. If anybody is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anybody kills with a sword, with a sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance and faith of the saints. Several points to raise there. Firstly, 42 months in verse 5. He was given authority to act for 42 months. Now that is three and a half years. If you remember already, we have had the, the two witnesses of God in the temple for three and a half years. Now he has another three and a half years of the seven. So this is the second half of those seven years. Satan, Satan's son has full authority on the earth. This is where God's put his hand back and said, OK, off you go. You go. You try. Verse 8. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb that has been slain. Some people look at that and think, well, that's unfair. That's unfair. Why is it that our name has to be written? So if my name's not in there, I can't be saved. So whatever I do, I can't be saved. That's not fair. And there's been various arguments over the years. I look at it slightly differently. I look at it like this, that if my name is written in that book, then no matter what happens, no matter what happens, I cannot lose my life. I cannot lose my salvation because my name has been written in that book. It is not a threat. It is a promise. And that the worst that Satan can throw at this world cannot take you out of God's hands. He can kill you. But that's the worst he can do. Because your name is written in the book, you cannot be lost. Verse 10. If anybody is destined to captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with a sword, with a sword he must be killed. What does that mean? It means that you cannot fight this. God is warning his people here, you cannot fight this. If you take up arms and fight against this, this beast, this person, you will lose. If it is in your destiny, if you like, to be captured and put into captivity and to be killed, then that's what will happen to you. In fact, Jesus says that the only thing you can do is run and hide. There is nothing you can do during this time but to run and hide. Nothing. This is the time when Satan has been given absolute authority on the earth. And he will use it. Let's go to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 4. I want to show you how this came about. How, how can you get it? How can possibly all this be happening and it's something that happened to Jesus and it's a decision that Jesus made and you know it well and it's the temptations in the wilderness and it's the last of the temptations in the book of Matthew and it's verse 8. So chapter 4, verse 8. Again the devil took him, this is Jesus, up to a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the devil left him. And behold, angels came and began to minister to him. That temptation that was given to Jesus, Jesus rejected it utterly. That same temptation, that same offer, is made to the son of Satan. 
you bow down and worship me and I will give you everything. Jesus at one describes describes Satan as the God of this world. This is Jesus describing Satan as that. He's not saying my father is the God of this world. He said Satan is the God of this world. And so if Satan says I will give to this person everything, he has the right to do so. Because he is the God of this world. And what is happening here is Remember one of the sections we read in the book of Daniel, it says he will worship a God that um, his fathers did not know, a God of fortresses, a God of war. That's Satan. And it talks about worshipping the dragon, the beast, the people in the world will worship the dragon. That's Satan. So Satan becomes the God of this world openly. At the moment he is the God of this world in secret. At this stage he becomes the open God of this world. And his son is sitting on the throne of this world. So you have Satan the father, the Antichrist the son. <clears throat> Let's go on. We're in Revelations again, for chapter 13. We've got the Father, we've got the Son. What's going to happen next? So Revelation chapter 13. And we're looking at verse 11. And this is after the events we've had described. And I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and it had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon and he exercised all the authority of the first beast in the presence in his presence and he made the earth and all those who dwell on it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed and he performed signs so that uh, great signs so that even made fire come down from heaven to the earth in the presence of men and he deceived those who dwelt on the earth because the signs which was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image of the beast, who had the wound with a sword and had come to life. We've got a new wee beastie here, the beast from the earth. And he looks like a lamb, he speaks, he looks like a lamb, but he speaks like a dragon. Now a lamb obviously is an innocent creature a sacrifice a, a pure holy creature and yet the words that are coming out of him are satan inspired now in some ways we have satan the father antichrist the son this is a creature that its purpose is to bring praise to um, satan and to the antichrist the holy spirit is intended to bring praise to Jesus and praise to the Father. So in some ways this is a very unholy spirit. And certainly it's been seen as that. This is the unholy trinity. Satan the Father, Antichrist the Son, the, um, the beast from the earth, or as later on we'll hear it called the false prophet, um, being the, the unholy spirit. There is something more behind this though that I want to look at. Firstly it's the beast from the earth. Now we talked in an earlier section about the, the idea that the, that the beast that comes from the sea is coming from the Gentile world and it's being brought up from the, from the nations of the world. When the Bible talks about the earth or the land it's often talking about the land of Israel. So this is a, a beast that arises from the land of Israel. Now that's not surprising because that is where the, the Antichrist at this stage has set up his camp. He set his tent up at Jerusalem. He has set himself on the throne in Jerusalem. And now an organisation arises from the land of Israel. And it has two horns. 
Now, as we talked about in the past, the horns are a symbol of rulers. So this is not just one person. It is an organisation with two people in charge of it. And it's an organisation that sets itself up in the temple. And it's an organisation where they can bring fire down from the sky. If you remember in our last session when we talked about the two witnesses of God who are based in the temple and for three and a half years, um, as it were, guard the temple and call people to worship God, one of the things they could do was bring down fire from heaven. What we have here is Satan's answer to the two witnesses. It is an organisation that is designed to bring praise to him, to bring praise to the Antichrist, and it is set up in the temple. It is a, a one world religion. And these are, if you like, the prophets of that one world religion. And once again, we have a symmetry. We have the two prophets of God, possibly Elijah and Enoch, who stand for three and a half years, preaching the word of God in the temple and then we have the two prophets of the Antichrist who stand in the temple and cause, make the world bring praise to the Antichrist for three and a half years. Once again, we have a, a symmetry. We have something else that goes on here as well. Revelation chapter 17. Let's go to Revelation 17. Um, and verse 15. In a previous session we talked about um, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. And I described it as a city, a, a, a city that rules the world. It's a city of trade. It's a city of a political power that is, is like the, um, the central government of this world power. It's the centre of world religion. All the world religions are sucked into this organisation. Um, and it's the centre of the occult. And it is a creation of Satan. It is a creation that he has used to, to bring to birth this empire. This beast that is ruling, that's going to rule the world. But you should know something about Satan that he does not love his creations. He will use them until the time is ripe, and then he will discard them. So we're chapter 17, and we'll look at verse 15 to see what happens next. And here's the division in which John is being shown the, the harlot, this great city. And he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot was sitting are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues and the ten horns which you saw and the beast these will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked and they will eat her flesh and they will burn her with fire for God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by having a common purpose and by giving their kingdoms to the beast until the word of God should be fulfilled and the woman you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Once the son of Satan has risen to the top of this organisation, he doesn't want anybody else interfering with his rule. He doesn't want anybody else to have the, the financial power over him. He doesn't want to have anybody else to have the religious power over him. So he sets about to destroy the the great harlot, this great city, this world capital, if you like. So he and those kings with him take it by force. And they make it theirs. They take command of this. They don't destroy it, but they take command of it. The one world religion is wiped out. Because he is setting up his own religion now and he will have no, no rival to that. There will be no other political power apart from his. He is the person now in charge. There will be no 
Parliament to tell him what to do, to argue with him. That will be gone. There will be no economic power that can restrain what he does. He takes command of that. And he uses that to a powerful effect. Now all the tools of control of this world are in his hands. And what does he do with it? Let's go back to Revelation 13. And we'll see how he uses that. Through this beast from the earth. We start with verse... Um, it was from verse 14. This is the beast from the earth. This is these two false prophets. This organisation that has now been set up um, by the Antichrist to bring praise to him and to the devil. He will deceive those who dwell on the earth because of the signs that he was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast. Telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who has had the wound with the sword and has come to life. So here's beyond any doubt. It says he, he was killed. He's come to life. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast. That the image of the, the beast might even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, the small and the great and the rich and the poor and the free and the slave, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he, pro he provides that no one should be able to buy or sell except those who have the mark either of the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who understands calculate the number of the beast. For the number is the number of a man, and his number is 666. The first thing that this false prophet does is to set up an idol. Or he doesn't set it up, he makes the nations of the world set the idol up. So it's not Satan putting it up there. It's not even the prophet. He, he makes the people do it. It's by force. What is this idol? Is it just a physical idol? It wouldn't. Some people have speculated that with all the, the modern IT and the knowledge and everything else, that this could be almost like a supercomputer. A supercomputer that reaches what scientists have been trying to do for ages, which is artificial intelligence to bring it to life. A computer that knows, that can look through the internet, like all the sci-fi films we've ever seen where the computer looks through and knows and can control. It is interesting that the, the armies of the world are trying to make um, autonomous drones that can work by computer and go around and kill people. You do wonder if Satan's behind that. It could be that. It could be that. It could equally be a statue that, through the power of Satan, comes to life. And it says it speaks. And it causes people to be killed. One of the things I question here is, is why an idol? Why does Satan want an idol of himself set up in... Or that the Antichrist wants an idol of himself set up in the temple? I mean, one of the reasons is that he will not actually stay in the temple. At the stage that this happens, he is on a, a, a mission for world conquest. And in fact, he's, to, I believe, two of the kings that he has to uproot are still at war with him. So he is only actually in the temple for a fairly short period of time where he has to then move on again. So this image of him is set up in the temple. And the question is, well, why an idol? What's so special about this? Let's go to the book of um, Isaiah. I'm going to read this from the NIV. I normally read from the New American Standard Version, but I want to read this from the NIV. Um, it's slightly a paraphrase, but it, it makes it slightly easier to understand. 
And we're going to Isaiah 41. And it's verse 21 to 24. And this is God, as it were, um, taking the mickey out of some of the nations of the world because they worship idols. And so it's Isaiah chapter 41, verse 21. Present your case, says the Lord. Set forth arguments, says Jacob's king. Bring in your idols to tell us what is going to happen. Tell us what the former things were so that we may consider them and know their final outcome or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what the future holds so that we may know that you are gods. Do something, whether it's good or bad, so that we may be dismayed and be filled with fear. But you are less than nothing. Your works are utterly worthless. You have chosen your detest. Uh, what you have chosen is detestable. This is God, as it were. Talk, he's talking to the Jewish people. He's talking to the nations of the world. And you're setting up idols. And at one other stage, it, it talks about you. You take a block of wood, you carve it to make your idol. You set it up and you worship. The rest of the bit, you, you burn on the stove. And you go, oh, lovely warm wood. You're burning the wood on the stove that you've made your idol out of. And here's God saying, OK, come on, idol, say something. Come on, move, do something. Tell me what happened in the past. Tell me what's happened in the future. And the, the book of Isaiah especially talks a lot about what's going to happen in the future. And Satan really wants to undermine this book, as I've said before. And so so-called theological scholars have looked at this and said ah there can't be one author to the book of Isaiah there's got to be more than one book because some of the things that are, are so specific that it can't have been done at the time it was said so, so there must have been a later author who wrote it and then the Jews just simply shoved it together into one big book that's it one German scholar got I think 120 different authors in the book of Isaiah modern scholarship says there's either two or three different authors and that's their way of trying to get round the, the prophecies that are so specific in the book of Isaiah. I think God has a slight sense of humour. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, they were all discovered in little bits in pots, apart from one book, which was the book of Isaiah, which was whole. The book of Isaiah was written by one person, by the prophet Isaiah. And it's God saying, I can predict the future. I can tell you what's going to happen. Can these other gods do that? But here's the Antichrist, or his proxy, the, the, the beast from the, the, the earth, setting up an idol that can speak, that can do things. This is once more Satan sticking two fingers up in the face of God. I can do that. You want an idol that can speak? There you go. You got one. This is, yeah, this is a Satan deliberately provoking God. The Antichrist at this stage moves on and it is this idol that takes up its position. This is the abomination that stands in the, the temple of God on the highest peak of the temple. And the Antichrist goes on to other things that we will look at at another stage. Whatever this statue is, it is set up in the temple. And some people say on the highest point in the temple, the, the, the part that shows it's the, the wing of the temple. That was the part where Jesus was taken by Satan and put on the, the highest point of the temple and told to throw himself off. And everybody will see you going down and everybody will know who you are and everybody will worship you. But well, here's this idol is put on the highest point of the temple that everybody can see it and that it can see everybody else. And people are brought before it. And those who will not bow down and worship it will be killed. And that starts in Israel. And it starts throughout the world. And it starts working out its way through the world. Also, you have the mark of the beast. What is this mark? Um, during the Second World War, the, the Nazi party gave ID out to people. And on that ID, if you were counted as not a threat 
or not Jewish, you had a swastika in your ID. And when you went to a shop, you had to show your ID. If they had the swastika in there, they would do business with you. If you did not have the swastika in there, if you had, say, a, a yellow star, they would not do business with you. So that is what we have here. So it's, it's a threat to people. If you have this mark, either on your forehead or the back of your hand, if you have this mark, then you can do business. You can buy food. If you don't, you can't. So it's like a way of wheedling people out. Now, during the COVID pandemic, there was a lot of fuss that people said that it was all a way of putting a silicon chip into your hand or into your arm. Um, and I think a lot of this, especially in Christian circles, comes from the idea that scientists had at one stage that uh, for financial dealings, you could put a silicon chip either in your head or in the back of your hand and all your card details could be stored in there. And that, that way you, you, no one could ever steal your card. That was an idea that was come up with. And I think in Christian circles, especially in America and places like that, the idea that Satan is trying to get us all chipped, silicon chipped. I could imagine there's certain government officials that would think that was an extremely good idea. Um, and a lot of people wouldn't take the COVID injection because they thought that they were being surreptitiously slipped a silicon chip, which I think is giving more credit to the to um, scientists to get a chip that small than than we deserve at this point. The thing, though, about the mark of the beast is it is not something that will be surreptitiously slipped onto you when you are not watching. The whole point of it is, is it's something you have to publicly accept. It is, it, it, the design is designed to wheedle out those people who will not accept it. Those people who will not accept the power of the beast. So it is to find out the will of the person. And so it is not something that will be sneaked onto you or tricked into taking in that sense. It is something that you will have to choose to take. And so whatever it is, whether it be a silicon chip, whether it just be a tattoo or whatever it happens to be, it will be something people choose to accept. Once again, here we have a symmetry. If you remember the 144,000 witnesses, each of them had the name of God and his Messiah written on their forehead. And now we have the number of the beast written on the forehead or the back of the hands of the followers of the beast. Once again, we have a symmetry. The number of the beast, 666. People get um, rather jumpy about this. In fact, the answer to what this means is actually child's play. Easy, it's easy. Literally child's play. In the, the old Jewish Hebrew alphabet, they did not have numbers. So the way they would um, represent a number is actually by using Hebrew letters as numbers. And so Aleph, the first letter is one, for instance, Beth is two, I believe, and so forth. And it works its way up through to, to the top. And so in order to learn these numbers and what they mean, you can imagine a school children being told to write down their name. And then to go through the list and say, right, work out the number of your name. And they would look down each letter and they would add it up and add it up and see so to find out what the number of their name is. And now this does appear in the New Testament in the book of Matthew. It talks about the number uh, 14 in the generations from um, King David to the Messiah, 14 generations. Well, no, uh, four, uh, I think to the exile and then from the exile to the um, to the Messiah, 14 generations. The number 14 is relevant because that's the number of David's name. So if you write David down, you look up the numbers, it is the number 14. So this is something that was known in the New Testament, is used. It may well be taught in Jewish schools nowadays to children when they learn Hebrew and when they learn how to, to read and write. It is child's play to someone who understands Hebrew. So the number 666 will be the number of the name of the Antichrist when it is written down in Hebrew 
and then you look up the numbers. This is a warning being given to, to the Jewish people. When they see the name of this person, you can imagine it written down in newspapers or whatever else, and then they write it down, a believing person could add it up and work it out and go, this is the person. There are, of course, multiple names and ways that this could be put. So it's not something you could do in advance. But it is a, a warning to the Jewish people of who this person is. Let's go to the book of John. Well, sorry, 1 John. 1 John. Final name, Antichrist, which I've used a few times. It's only used in the book of John. And in some ways it's the best way of understanding this person. Because it tells you what they are in, them, in and of themselves. So 1 John, and it's chapter 2, 18 to 24. Children. It is the last hour, and just as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have arisen, for this we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us, for if they had been of us they would have remained with us, but they went out in order to show that they are not of us. But you have an anointing from the Most Holy One, and you know and I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie um, is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father, and the one who confesses the Son has the Father also. As for you... Let that abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If you have heard from the beginning, if you have, what you have heard from the beginning abides in you, you will abide in the Son and in the Father. The idea of the Antichrist is not that this person will pretend to be Jesus. He is not here to pretend to the world, I am Jesus, come back again, worship me. He is as it were, offering the world, I say offering, threatening the world, demanding of the world that he be taken as the Christ. And where it says, um, it talks about the blasphemous things being spoken about God and spoken about um, other people, this person will basically say that that Jesus bloke wasn't the Messiah. Indeed, the God that you have been worshipping isn't the God. And he will say it to the Jewish people, he will say it to the world, the God you have been worshipping is wrong. I worship the true God. Here is the power. And you can see the power. And everything that Jesus bloke supposed to have done, dying and coming back to life, I can do that. Everything he is, I am and better. I am the one and you will worship me. I am in charge. I am the God of this world. And you will worship me. And he will set up his system. He will set this one world power that Satan has been spending so long developing everything to control the world. And to put himself as the king in Jerusalem. So that everything that God has said that he would do for Jesus, the Antichrist will do for himself. He will be the one. Who sets up the world? He will rule. If this is like this is Satan throwing two fingers up in God's face, you think you can win? You can't. I have won. My son is in charge. Let's go on in the book of John, the chapter four. And it's verse one to six. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit and see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. 
Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus is of God, this is the spirit of Antichrist. For which you have heard that it is coming, and now already is in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you that is in, than is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not of God will not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Three and a half years, God is in charge of the temple. The two witnesses, the 144,000 witnesses around the world. For three and a half years, Satan is in charge of the temple. And his witnesses, his people are in charge. And it is full, this is God's way. God is organising this. He has allowed it to force the world to make a decision. At the end of this time, there will be nobody on this planet who has not made a decision. Now that decision may be to take the mark of the beast. That decision may be to reject the mark of the beast. And if they reject the mark of the beast, they will be killed. Interestingly, there's a great host that appears in heaven at one stage. And the Apostle John asks the angel, who are these people? And the angel says to them, the, or the elders says to them, these are the people who have come out of the great tribulation. These are the ones who have washed their robes. These are the ones who will be in the temple of God forever. Why? Because they would not take the mark of the beast. Interesting, they weren't baptised. They didn't have to go to communion. They didn't have to become a church member. All they had to do, I say all, was not take the mark of the beast. It involved them being killed. I love the, the thief on the cross. He didn't have to do any of the religious things that we sometimes make people do. But he was saved and he was in paradise. These people come out of this time. They have accepted the, the, the witness of 144,000. They have accepted the witness of the two, uh, the two witnesses in Jerusalem. And when it comes to a decision, they decide they would rather die than take the mark of the beasts. And they will be in the temple of God forever. Let's go to the book of Daniel. One last time. Daniel 9. And we're looking at verse 27. This, just before this, is the section that talks about the, 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 the people of the prince who is to come. Verse 27. And it's talking to start with about this, the Antichrist. He will make a firm covenant with many for one week. And in the middle of that week, he will put a stop to the sacrifice and grain offerings. And, and on the wing of abomination will come one who makes desolation. This is that idol. This is... This Antichrist setting himself up in the throne room of the temple. Even until a complete destruction. Once again, destruction, son of destruction. One that is decreed is poured out on one who makes desolate. Interesting little phrase that one who is decreed is poured out on one who makes desolate. We have the Son of God, we have the Son of Satan. We have three and a half years where God's witnesses speak. We have three and a half years where Satan's witnesses speak. At the end of that three and a half years, somebody is poured out onto the one who makes desolation. If you know the book of Revelations, you know that the events just before the, the second coming is the pouring out of the bowl or the wrath of God. The final pouring 
of this final bowl is the second coming when Jesus himself comes to this earth and Jesus himself will slay the Antichrist the one who has set himself up in opposition to God the one who has set himself up against everything that God stands for that is the end of the Antichrist at that stage it will be the worst time this world has ever known Jesus described this as the great tribulation greater than anything anybody has ever known on this planet at that stage when Jesus comes back everybody would have made a decision there will be nobody who has not made a decision and that also includes the Jewish people now we will look at that with a bit more detail later on because that will be the final nail in Satan's coffin so we end with a word of prayer Lord it is not comfortable reading it is not joyous and uplifting it is frightening it is depressing but you Lord are the one who knows you Lord are the one who knows from the end from the beginning Lord I pray that many 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 will hear your voice and believe your word and not be fooled and not be deceived and be willing to make the sacrifice Lord, when all of us have to choose who is our God. Lord, as Jesus said in the wilderness, get thee behind me, Satan. You shall worship the Lord your God with, and him only shall you worship. Lord, may those ministering angels be ready to receive your your saved people Amen and Amen